Well, greetings. <laughs> Very happy to be here. And I'm not sure how to follow up on an introduction like that, <laughs> except by going right to the chase. So my subject tonight is what reality has taught me. Reality has taught me some things that really have astonished me and was not what I was expecting when I began my uh, adventures in science. But I think they are mind-expanding lessons that ramify beyond what's normally thought of as science into philosophy. Philosophy wasn't always separate from science and I don't think should be regarded as separate from science. And even, philosophy, and even theology. So the first thing that science teaches, I think when you study it profoundly, is humility. This is the famous picture of planet Earth from the moon, our nearest neighbor in space. And already from the moon, the Earth, where human history plays out, where we always all live our lives and think of as terribly important, uh, looks very small, looks very pretty against the blackness of space and very different from the rest, uh, but very small. <laughs> and that's from our nearest neighbor. When we study the universe in more depth, we learn that not only is uh, Earth small compared to the entire sky as seen from the moon, but it's a small part of the solar system, which in turn is a small part of the galaxy. And then when you study uh, deep space using this Hubble Space Telescope here, you find that, and look at very dim objects, you see that galaxies are also as common as dust. And the, the extended objects in this picture are not stars, but, but each one of them a galaxy containing, on the average, 100 billion stars, each of which is like the sun, many of which will contain solar systems. <clears throat> comparable to ours, and many of them probably housing forms of intelligence uh, comparable to what we find on Earth, or maybe better. When we turn from space to time, we find a similar story. It's difficult for human minds to comprehend the vastness of time, Human lifetimes are very, very small compared to the lifetime of the universe. But a convenient device for it is to compress the history of the universe into a single day. Just scale down time linearly, scale it uniformly, so that the time since the Big Bang, when the universe was a very, very different place, and uh, in many ways began to take uh, well, take a form that we can, dis we can discuss using the equations of physics that we know, uh, that was 13.8 billion years ago. And we can form a coherent history with many pieces of uh, confirming evidence, starting from the idea that the universe was a hot, dense place, rapidly expanding, but very uniform at first, with no structure, 13.8 uh, billion years ago. And then uh, nothing much happens <laughs> from, from the point of view of mind in the universe, or certainly mind here on Earth, uh, for most of the year. And then school starts uh, on 6th of September when the, uh, the Earth was cool enough and, uh, to form solid rocks. Before that, it was molten or didn't exist at all. It was just a scattered 
uh, fragments of, of rock and dust surrounding the sun. And uh, we go on. Uh, the, the calendar gets denser, but only because we humans are more interested in the events that happen later. On December 25th, dinosaurs emerge. So December 25th, the year's almost over. We're almost to the present compared to the origin at the Big Bang. And uh, it's only on the 26th of December that a meteor hit the Earth and uh, destroyed the reign of the dinosaurs as the dominant land species on Earth. And uh, it was only... Uh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. It was only on December 30th at 624 that that extinction event occurred. There was another great extinction event that killed the crocodiles and made way for the dinosaurs, it turns out. Uh, and all of human history takes place on the very last day. In fact, in the last few minutes of the last day. So, both from the point of view of space and from the point of view of time, humility is very much in order. That's one lesson. The other lesson, however, is complementary to that. Remember that word? And that's self-respect. This is a drawing by the great neurophysiologist, the great Spanish neurophysiologist, Raymond Cajal, of a small section, a very, very narrow slice, uh, so that light could get through it, uh, that's taken through a microscope, of the cat's hippocampus. Okay? So cats are reasonably intelligent, but you know, there's, they're cats. Uh, that, <laughs> and this slice is basically one cell thick, and the, uh, the great innovation that made uh, these drawings by Ramon Cajal possible was a discovery by Golgi uh, a little bit earlier that with a certain kind of dye, uh, you, the cells would either take up the dye entirely and stain black so you could see them uh, and their form distinctly, or they wouldn't take it up at all. So a kind of quantum theory of uh, staining. Uh, it's not really understood to this day why that occurs, but it's a great gift because it makes it possible, because only one in a hundred or so cells take it up, to, uh, to see the form. Otherwise, you would just see a, a totally entangled mass of, of cells and not be able to draw anything. But when you apply the stain you f to this extremely thin slice of a small part of the cat's brain, the hippocampus, you find this ma magnificent structure, the sort of thing that you might imagine a computer architect building to process systematic flow of information. And to me, when I look at this picture and others like it, the emergence of mind from matter comes to seem less unlikely. Also, besides humility, when you realize that uh, we're very small compared to the universe, but we're very large compared to what it takes to process information. Whereas a galaxy contains a hundred billion stars, a human brain contains about a hundred million neurons, each of which is a, a significant information processor. So not only humility is in order, but also self-respect. We're small in some ways, but very large in others. I should say, similarly with respect to time, if you ask yourself, 
How many thoughts is it possible to support in a human lifetime? Well, it's a vague question because what is a thought and what how? But uh, many ways, many different ways of making the estimate based on, for instance, how many images you can process, how, how, uh, how, how uh, big a spacing does it take between images in a movie before it breaks up, so how fast you can process images, how fast you can play the piano, how fast you can talk. All these things lead to about 40 thoughts per second as an estimate, and that means several billion independent thoughts in a lifetime, which is a lot. Think about it. You have lots of, lots of time to think about it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, this state, this uh, uh, remarkable kind of wailing or uh, whining from Pascal <laughs> uh, early in the history of the scientific revolution uh, rings true in both directions much more 500 years later, the spaces of the universe enfold me and swallow me up like a speck, but by the power of thought, I may comprehend the universe. And that is not just uh, a boast that we can comprehend the universe, but it's something you can make quantitative. Uh, in terms of how our increased power, increased knowledge of how to use the resources that nature gives us has enabled people to uh, live much richer lives. Uh, this is in terms of world GDP per capita. Uh, less technically, you might think of how much energy does a human use to support their lifestyle? And you would get a very similar graph, and you see that uh, the, the, the slope that it's taken off since scientific knowledge became systematic, and there's no end in sight. So there's humility, there's self-respect, and then a third great lesson that I've learned is chutzpah. Now, this may be a somewhat unfamiliar word. Let me define it for you. It's a Yiddish word. It's the quality of audacity, for good or bad. Could mean insolence, cheek. Great word. And here's a more dignified way of saying the same thing. Uh, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible, that we learn that uh, despite the universe being so big, also so complicated, when you look at, at the, the smaller things, how, how complicated, the, think of it's big that way, it's big that way, and it's even bigger when you go from top to bottom. The, the, um, the thing is, we can uh, try to understand it and we succeed. <laughs> so, inspired by that, I'd like to uh, tell you uh, my latest chutzpah as an example of what I've learned from reality uh, and how sort of I'm, I talk back now. <laughs> So part of the audacity is pushing our understanding further and further and, hope, and, and trusting that if we try to make the description more logically coherent, more beautiful, that more symmetric, that we'll be rewarded. That we can, in that sense, read the mind of God and try and see and anticipate how things are going to work what we think, the way we think things should work, often turns out to be the way things do work. So let's keep trying. Now, 
When I was a teenager, I went on a shopping expedition with my mother and saw up on the shelves a laundry detergent named Axion. And at that time, I was learning a little bit about physics, so I learned about pions and mesons and baryons and said, oh, gosh, Axion, that sounds like a particle. It's, it's got a, a nice Greek root. It's short. It's really forceful when you say it. If I ever get the chance to name a particle, I'm going to use Axion. And then a few years later, I got the chance. Uh, it turned out, in fact, that there was a problem in fundamental physics that involved something called an axial current. And so this, the, star, the stars were aligned. And I was able to get this name uh, attached to a crucial particle that our audacity in trying to improve the equations of physics uh, suggests should exist. We still don't know if it does exist, but if it does exist, it would enable us to make the fundamental understanding of nature much more coherent and beautiful. Uh, let me just say what, what the issue is. The issue is a very strange feature of fundamental laws of, that has been true since the days of Isaac Newton, so since the modern science began, even though it's not only not necessary to explain the world we experience, it's positively an embarrassment. It's the feature of the fundamental laws that is called time reversal symmetry. In visual terms, and, uh, it's if you take a movie of fundamental interactions, so take a movie of it, of them, and by mistake, insert the reel backwards so that the time sequence is reversed, this wrong movie would still obey the laws of physics. Now, everyday life is not like that. We get older, not younger, uh, and so forth. Uh, so it's kind of embarrassing to have the, law, the fundamental laws have that property. We, then we have, we have to explain why everyday experience doesn't have that property. That's an interesting story in itself. But another question is why the laws have that property in the first place. And it turns out that as we've understood fundamental interactions more profoundly, we've learned that there are powerful constraints on what's consistent with other principles. And when you apply those constraints, you find that this time reversal property almost emerges as a logical consequence. Almost, but not quite. To make it actually work, that's what you need axions for. Okay, so axions should exist, should exist. According to me, they should exist. Uh, in a completely different domain of observations, experiments, and concepts, meanwhile, that I didn't know about at the time, Astronomers were finding something very strange. They were finding in a variety of contexts, including the one I've shown here, which I'll explain momentarily, that there was too much gravity. There is too much gravity. The, that if you, for instance, look here at a distant galaxy that's behind another cluster of galaxies, you see not one image, but repeated images of that galaxy, a very distorted kind of thing, as if you're looking through the bottom of a Coke bottle. Maybe many of you are probably too young to know about Coke bottles. Okay, so the explanation of this, that, that is very appealing because it's based on known principles plus 
uh, an extra hypothesis, is that what's going on is a dramatic illustration of the bending of light, which is one of the famous consequences of the general theory of relativity, our modern theory of gravity. Namely, if you uh, look at that distant galaxy, you see there's a direct path through the cluster that's in between that and the Earth, but there are also paths of light where the light gets bent and arrives back at Earth at an angle. And if you think about it, if you're looking through a telescope at Earth, those rays occurring at an angle will look at it like additional copies of, this, of, this, of the galaxy behind. So you can, and you can make all this quantitative, and it kind of works. The bending of light is, the patterns are right and everything, but in order to make it work quantitatively, you need to have about six times as much mass, or seven times as much mass, in this cluster of galaxies as you get by adding up all the stars, all the gas clouds, all the things that are studied in astronomy that we know about. So the hypothesis that astronomers developed is that in addition to the stuff we see, there's another component to the universe that has escaped, somehow escaped notice for thousands of years, or in fact, 13.8 billion years, uh, that's uh, causing the light to bend, so it, it gravitates like all matter, but interacts very, very weakly otherwise, and this is what came to be known as the dark matter. Now, if it was just this kind of observation, the case wouldn't be very strong, but there are many lines of evidence that are all consistent and all get explained by this hypothesis of dark matter. So it looks like, it looks like there's an extra particle that interacts much more weakly with ordinary matter than the particles that we've discovered so far. That makes sense, because if it interacts very, very weakly, it's hard to find, and that, that's, that's called the dark matter. So we have an, a good name for it, but we don't really know what it is in terms of what its mass is, how it interacts with other things. We know it interacts weakly, but how exactly? None of that is uh, clear experimentally. But, remember axions, it turns out that axions have exactly the right properties to make the dark matter. So, trusting in Einstein, who said, subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not, uh, one is led to suspect that axions are the dark matter. <laughs> How do you go about testing something like that? How do you go about building on that chutzpah? Well, once upon a time, people didn't know how to detect radio waves either. They had equations for radio waves, Maxwell's equations, but radio waves don't register in our ordinary God-given senses. We need to develop special antennas, special monitors in order to pick them up. And the equations, Maxwell's equations, tell us how to do that. And it, it was a difficult thing. It took uh, over 30 years for people to t test those equations and start uh, constructing modern radio technology. Here's the similar challenge now for modern technology. We have this hypothetical particle. We have equations for how it's supposed to interact with matter, but the equations tell us the interactions are very, very weak. So one thing, so we have to design appropriate antennas. They're gonna be a new kind of, a new kind of antenna. Uh, the, uh, here, here's your antenna. Okay, so problem solved. Now, this is a schem schematic idea of the concept that goes into the antenna, namely, axions interact with pairs of photons, 
and it's convenient to supply magnetic fields. Physicists are very good at building big magnetic fields. And in the presence of a magnetic field, therefore, axions can turn into photons. And to make this happen efficiently, you have to be clever about uh, what, this, what goes into this box besides the magnetic field, but that's the basic idea. And uh, by the way, you don't look at it with your eyeball. Uh, it turns out it's, mic it's microwave radiation that you need to look at here. And, and this is the box. This is a prototype of the box that we think will be capable of doing the job. Uh, this was a first crude prototype. It worked better than expected, but the final product will be far more polished and made of copper instead of brass and so forth. Also, when it's actually in operation, it will have to be made very cold and importantly, it will have to go in a big magnet. But fortunately, we have a magnet. And this, 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 and you can see how big it is. What you can't see from this picture is that uh, inside that chamber is a magnetic field of 13 Tesla extending over uh, more than a meter in length and almost a meter in uh, uh, diameter. So this is uh, quite a piece of hardware. And we estimate that it'll give us a fighting chance of finding axions if they are the dark matter. <clears throat> now, this is uh, Copenhagen, after all. And no, and I, independent of that, and I've given this similar talks elsewhere, I, I always do talk about complementarity. It's not just Copenhagen, but, but uh, it's nice to be talking about it in Copenhagen. Uh, complementarity is perhaps to me maybe the deepest, but also the most surprising thing that reality has taught me. This is something I certainly didn't anticipate when I was starting in science as, as a teenager, that I would learn a philosophical lection, uh, a philosophical principle called complementarity, which would become very important to me. And in fact, when I first learned about this in physics, I was not impressed. I thought it was kind of just blather. But as, as I've uh, thought more deeply about it, it's it's become more and more important to me. So what is complementarity? Well, it was enunciated as a principle and used in physics by Niels Bohr especially, but others anticipated it in other contexts. Uh, a beautiful description of complementarity is due to the author F. Scott Fitzgerald. He didn't use the concept explicitly or the word, but it's, this is the idea. It's the ability to hold two opposing ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. And uh, uh, marriage is an example of that. <laughs> <laughs> In quantum mechanics, it's a necessary part of understanding quantum mechanics, in my opinion. Because in quantum mechanics, the complete description of a system is something called its wave function. But we cannot observe wave functions directly. So the reality, the mathematical description is not a direct description of reality in the same way that, say, uh, Newton's description of particles moving and planets moving around the sun is a pretty direct description of what you actually see. Rather, if you want to use quantum mechanics to make predictions, 
you have to use wave functions, but you have to process the wave functions in different ways to answer different kinds of questions. And those processes are often mutually incompatible. So if you want to take a wave function and process it in a way that enables you to make predictions about the positions of a particle, you have to do one kind of processing. If you want to take the wave function and use it to make predictions about the velocity of the same particle, you have to process it in a different way. And it turns out the ways of processing are mutually incompatible. This, once you, well, and that's in quantum mechanics, it's a theorem. You can actually prove that it's, they're mutually incompatible. This is the essence of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But there's a beautiful, more uh, user-friendly example of complementarity that was taught to me by a musical friend of mine, which is actually very similar to uh, the complementarity that you find in quantum mechanics between position and momentum. I'll come back to that momentarily. But here, we have complementarity between harmony and melody. If you want to pay attention to the harmony of a piece, then you process it one moment at a time, and you see the patterns of chords that are being made. If you want to appreciate the melody, certainly in a polyphonic piece, any complex piece of music, Usually there are several melodies going on, or there's a melody line and a bass line that are distinct. And to see those, you have to look at it more globally. You have to take, a, take it apart, take apart those chords and see them uh, process a, the, the music in a different way. Uh, this, as I said, is very similar to what goes on in quantum mechanics, where to talk about position, you talk about different points in space, to talk about momentum, you have to process the wave function in a more melody-like way, <laughs> a more global way. And they interfere with each other. You can't do both at once. Here's a more stripped-down conceptual version of how quantum mechanical objects work that do doesn't involve heavy mathematics, but just hard thinking. So suppose we have objects that have two colors, uh, two, two properties rather, colors and shapes. Okay. And we, we have ways of measuring either one. But if we measure the shape, we destroy the color. If we measure the color, we destroy the shape. That's what happens in complementarity. That's what happens in the processing things in order to extract information. You have to, you have to be able to think about them in different ways at the same time to do full justice to the underlying reality. So I think this has applications to many problems that are thought to be philosophical problems. We don't have to decide between mind and matter as components of our description of the world. Both concepts are uh, useful in different circumstances. And you know, if we're gonna understand how someone is going to react to a drug or a physical therapy, we can think of them as matter. It makes sense to think about the underlying molecules and what they'll do, or the underlying muscles. But if we want to think about how they're going to behave, how they're going to respond to teaching or respond to, I don't know, you know uh, a screaming fit, uh, then we should think about their minds and think of, have a, quite a different kind of model. And thinking about the molecules is not very helpful. Similarly, determinism and free will 
They're both important concepts. Determinism is what emerges from our fundamental laws of physics, but it's determinism of wave functions, so it's a little cheesy because you can't process the wave functions fully. Uh, on the other hand, free will is an absolutely necessary concept in law and morality and dealing with human situations. So we need both. It can't be either or. So uh, finally, I don't know how much time I've spent, but it's about right, I guess. We can have a nice question session. It's possible to transcend reality. You may have objected quietly in your mind as I discussed how it's not really possible to absorb melody and harmony at the same time. You can with practice or, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do both at once. You can listen to the music several times, experience it and gradually and get the whole reality that way. So it's possible to transcend reality and uh, nowadays, also in quantum mechanics, okay, you, you can't experimentally access the full wave function, but if you have theoretical understanding, you can calculate it and then understand it fully. And if you have many screens, you could process it in different ways on different screens and, and imaginatively reconstruct the whole thing. So the general idea of transcending complementarity is the next step after you realize that there is complementarity, I think. And to me, a beautiful example is always more convincing than an abstract description. And I'd like to show you a beautiful example of transcending complementarity that I hope you'll enjoy. You can see the harmonies and the melodies at the same time. Bring in extra elements of the brain. Anticipate the future. And to me, it adds enormously to the experience to open up your mind this way. Appreciate complementarity, but also look for ways to get beyond it. Okay, with that, I think I'll close and, and take questions. <laughs> Thank you.